Hiran Darren Turnquest is a Bahamian native celebrated for his distinct ability to inspire, motivate, cultivate, and drive the change process. An accomplished counseling psychologist, public speaker, youth development specialist, and corporate trainer, Mr. Turnquest has proven his ability to galvanize individuals, communities, institutions, and organizations to be the change we want to see. In 2005, Mr. Turnquest received his Bachelor of Science in Psychology with a minor in Political Science from Acadia University in Scotia, Canada. And in 2007, he earned a Master in Psychology from Anna Maria College in Pakistan, Texas. While pursuing his master's degree, Mr. Turnquest worked at numerous institutions for at-risk youth in Boston. We can have everyone mute their mics, please. After completing his degree and work term in Massachusetts, Dr. Turnquest followed his dream of wanting to return to the Bahamas. No stranger to hard work and with a strong commitment to service. Upon his return home, he served as a counseling psychologist at the Bahamas Crisis Center and as the Director of Residential Planning at the Bahamas Institute of Adolescent and Child Mental Health. In 2007, Mr. Turnquest served in dual capacity as a psychologist and classroom teacher at St. Andrews School in Nassau. Today, Mr. Turnquest's goal has always been to build the capacity of young Bahamians through strategic training platforms. Today, he serves as a corporate trainer and coach to many major companies throughout the country. Mr. Turnquest serves as an adjunct professor of psychology at the College of the Bahamas and has served as clinical director for key potential counseling. In September 2017, Mr. Turnquest was promoted to the position of Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Culture. In April of this year, Mr. Turnquest resigned his position with government and has now joined the executive of the Bahamas Telecommunications Corporation, where he holds responsibility for direct sales sales effectiveness, and residential products. Currently, Mr. Turnquest is completing studies towards his doctorate in organizational leadership and human resource development at Barry University, Miami, Florida. So coming to present to you now on the topic of one second, men as allies in the fight to prevent domestic violence, Mr. Darren Turnquest. Thank you very much um, for having me. Uh, this is, of course, not an exciting topic to speak about, but an exciting topic for me to present on. And I'll tell you why it's exciting because I was really introduced to this work by Dr. Sandra Dean Patterson at the tender age of about 27 years old when I first returned home to do work with the uh, Bahamas Crisis Center. And a colleague of mine that I met in Washington DC really uh, energized me in understanding the whole idea and concept that men can stop rape, men can stop violence. And not seeing this as a women's issue, but definitely seeing that domestic violence is is an issue that impacts women, but it's an issue that men are suffering with. And that, that suffering has taken place for a whole number of reasons. And we're gonna talk about acceptance, we're gonna talk about embracing, we're gonna talk about cultural norms, we're gonna talk about the whole idea that we have come to in a society where we have romanticized the idea of objectifying women, but not only objectifying women, but what we say and what we do and the way that's embraced and accepted. And I think when we, when we go away and we go to different places, we understand that the language that we use in this country is not the language that we would use in other countries that are very serious about the way that we see, um, we see women, we appreciate, respect, and value women. Um, but also, it's, it's another issue on the way women treat other women in support of men in their mentalities of objectifying women, looking at domestic violence as something that's necessary to put a woman in line. 
And I think I want to speak to everyone because, you know, the perpetrator of domestic violence from the male perspective has no look, has no socioeconomic demographic. Uh, it could be your neighbor, it could be your friend, it could be your brother. And in some cases, we're very much aware that it has been some of our fathers who have perpetrated this. And in some cases, we understand that the statistics state that one out of every individual or 10 individuals who would have recognized or observed this type of violence will also be the perpetrator of this type of violence. And so in working in the crisis center, uh, I got a very first-hand approach of what it was to work uh, with victims of domestic violence, but in some instances in a roundabout way, you would always have the perpetrator who would in some cases come in with the victim who's not identified that the issues in the home is domestic violence, but in the conversation as you begin speaking to the couple, you recognize that domestic violence for some of our uh, women in relationships and for some of our, our women, period, is not something that they necessarily see as violence, is something that they see as a component of a marriage. And I think that happens because, of course, we have it happening so consistently in our country, but so consistently in our communities that in certain islands and, and certain homes, it is just understood, accepted, and embraced to the point where kids who are living in these homes do not see this as abnormal. So then you also see this as a, as a, 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 a throw over into these, into these young people when they get into the school environment. So I wanna tell you that I've had the opportunity of working um, across the country from St. Andrew's School to Lightford Key to everywhere. We, domestic violence in our country is an epidemic. And, and I'd need this to say that COVID-19 is not the only pandemic that we are dealing with, but globally, domestic violence can be seen also as a pandemic because in certain cultures, it is so readily acceptable to, to place women in the positions because of course the machismo factor that we facilitate from man to man is something that is just not only celebrated, but also applauded. And so let's get down to the meats and potatoes. What drives this violence? It's a small man syndrome, a small mind syndrome. It's a, it's a cultural protection where men are of the opinion that they are, they are worthy to be ahead of a home because of biblical reasons, because of familial reasons, because their daddy says that they should be the head of the home. And so what men have to begin to do now is understand what is driving the violence, understand that it is the small them towards a big woman that makes them feel even smaller and the only object or the only opportunity they have to, to take that woman down uh, is because of their small mindedness is to put their hand on them. And so you find that in the barbershop or in the neighborhood conversations or on the street, you know, if a woman walks up to a man in our country and speaks a particular way, the first thing one of their friends or colleagues would say, depending on where you are and who's around is, for you willing to show all the way, you know, we the top up, man, you know, because serious man, them can have their woman, them talking to them like that, or to have their empress talking to them like that. And we believe that this is only in a particular demographic of our society, but understanding that it is through and through the fiber of our society, from our politicians to our doctors, our lawyers, our bank managers, to our garbage truck uh, our collectors, it impacts at all levels. And so when we think what drives the violence, it is not the behavior of a woman that drives a man to, to be violent. It is the mentality of a man who has no conflict resolution skills or understands the value of the human being as an equal next to him that drives this particular violence. It is also because culturally, men have been taught to hold their issues in and not go about to speak to their issues. And I think Dr. Uh, Thompson Hebron was speaking about our faith and, and speaking about, you know, counseling and speaking about the holistic development of the individual, the being. Some of our men are only a quarter of the men that they could be because they've not dealt with the issues or the skeletons or the problems or the difficulties of their own past. And so they bring their demons, men, into your current relationships because you want somebody to make you feel adequate. And so the ally means is that men have to check men. 
Men have to draw to other men's attention when there are questionable discussions that are happening that go against the fiber of what you know a good family man to be, a good Bahamian man to be. And we must begin to re-identify or redefine what a good man looks like. Because a good man is not only a provider, um, is, he's not only a protector, but he's also a respecter of all women, of all beings, um, even the dog. Right? And so we must understand what, what that means. And then we must have a discussion about who is impacted because sometimes men in our discussions only believe that it is the woman that they're hitting that's being impacted by the violence that's presented. But it's, it's everybody in the family unit that's being impacted by that violence and also their colleagues and friends. Because once one man is able to romanticize an abusive relationship or the way he treats his significant other, it then becomes commonplace or it becomes common practice or acceptable practice for other men to believe it's okay. While you have a good, decent man who is standing by listening to this conversation, but is afraid to speak up because he is being outnumbered. Good things, bad things happen to good people when good people sit down, stand up, or simply do nothing about it. It also means who is impacted by it is the conversations that we have on social media and the way we project this idea of violence, the way we project this idea of how women is treated. And so what we see is even in police violence against women and male officers as well, uh, we see violence against women, period, is somewhat discussed in our social media platforms as that's good for her. She needed that, her mouth too hard. I'm sorry, but we must understand as men that there is no reason under the sun for anybody to say nasty things or put their hands on, on any woman for that matter. And so when we think about violence, we must not only think about violence as physical violence, men, but we must also think about what we say and how we interact with, our, with, with women. And so I wanna use it in terms of domestic violence. I was just watching The Crown the other day, season four of The Crown, and I know many of us will chuckle. But the honest truth is, if you watch season four of The Crown and you watch Prince Charles' interactions with Diana and the way he spoke to her, that is domestic violence. And so Diana uh, was a woman who suffered domestic violence from a man who had some significant familial issues that he himself could not have dealt with to which a woman being impacted by his issues, not only in his verbal abuse, but also in his very demeanor and presence with her, forced that woman to now have what we call a psychological or a mental disorder that made her feel less than. And so the, the thing is, who can stop this violence? It is not a woman that can stop this violence because a woman can walk out of the violent situation, man, but another woman will become victim. And so the violence, when we say, well, women can st stop violence or, or men, women can, can, can walk out or leave. No, no, no. A woman leaving is only a, a door stop or a small stop before another woman falls into the trap of this violent situation. And one thing that we talk about in the, in the crisis center during my years there with Dr. Patterson was this whole uh, coaching and the whole honeymoon period. And we look at the cycle of violence because of course that man is not going to come off violent um, in the first instant, but six or seven weeks in, it becomes where a door is slammed in her face or it becomes where you know uh, she is called a bitch or, or something of the sort. And it begins to escalate more and more and more. And so I also want to talk about violence against young women and young girls. You know, what we say to these young women when they walk past, the cat calling, you know, the way we are able to objectify them. You know, girl, come here, bring that big thing here. Or come here, let me, let me show you what I could do to you. Those things are violence against women because those are not for, uh, 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 solicited commentary. Those are not solicited insults. They are things that a man feels because of his manhood, he is in a position to state those things. Sadly enough, I'll tell you that men, so many of us in the professional realm are so comfortable with these things that could never fly if we were in the United States of America or we were in Canada or we were in any of those places. But because we have such a slack culture and the machismo factor is something that is glorified, it gives us space to be less than the men that we should be.
I want to take you to this particular slide. It says, violence against women is, is typically char characterized as a women's issue. And, and for the majority of the fact, the perpetrators of this are men. So it is a man's issue. We covered that. We have had many gains, but our gains in this country, we have the Department of Gender Affairs and we have all of these different policies and we've done a, a significant amount of training with the police force about how we deal with domestic violence because needless to say, um, 10 years ago, it was garbage. It was absolute garbage. Um, garbage used to be exact. And I think the police force has made some significant gains in terms of how they handled the DV uh, relationships but it was solely the responsibility or the, or the fell on the shoulders of some strong women, and in some cases, some strong men in the advocacy realm that had to advocate for safe spaces. My question is, what, what exactly are men doing beyond the policy to make certain that policy is put into practice, to make certain that everyday language is impacted, to make certain that we're able to check every single man that comes into our interaction, to make certain that when we're in the barbershop, we can stand up to say, my man, not near boss, not, not near. I don't, I don't co-sign that. And so what are we doing? Because sometimes we are so busy as men trying to be embraced and accepted that we don't want to speak out because we feel as though we're speaking out against a senior man. And if the senior man says that he has beat his wife or he has talked to his girl this way, or he has tear up his daughter's backside, and that's a whole another discussion about men and the way they handle their daughters and what they should be permitted to do with their daughters, because that then puts a psyche into young women who have been fathered by some men that it's okay for men to put their hands on them a particular way. Be careful what you say to your daughters because they will begin to understand or appreciate that the way you talk to them by calling them a slut or a whore or calling them whatever, that that is the status quo. So we must make certain that policy is placed into practice, but even with the practice, we must stop violence in order to, and in order to stop this, we must change, have a see a change in our people and that means women too. And I, I, I see that only men is here, but, we, but women in this country sometimes gas men up to go home and punch up their wives or punch up their daughters or punch up their sisters because they themselves have come in a toxic environment and that toxicity is, is moved over. So we must work together to change as a people and then after changing as a people, we must work individually. We must begin to change our culture because not because we are a uh, strong black man means that we must have this uh, monster impression that, that we cannot be lovers and caretakers and romancers and that we could speak in the passive voice and that we're able to embrace our, our loved ones with words. We must change our perspective. And the perspective is, is that we don't, any violence must be unacceptable. Violence against women and children is even more unacceptable than any other violence because it has been a historic or, or what we call a systemic challenge that we've had where women have continuously been oppressed. Um, and I know some men are in this room right now, not comfortable with this discussion. Bottom line is, I don't care. The attitude is to be uncomfortable to make a difference for you to go out there to understand what the wrongs are. And then some are saying, you know, women have enough power. Power and respect are two completely different things. And we must understand it as such. And we must change our language. So the next time you use the word bitch, the next time you use the word slut, the next time you use the word top up, the next time you, 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 you do the sick sick, you must understand what if this was your mother? What if this was your daughter? What if this was any of the women in your life that you absolutely care about? And if there's no women in your life that you care about, then maybe it's time to step into just a couple sessions of therapy. And then after that, hopefully you could find Jesus or Jesus and then therapy. I don't know which way, but, I, but this goes to both men and women because I think it's important for us to understand that there's a two way street as well. Apathy is unacceptable. And apathy means it ain't my business. Man, listen, I, my wife, that, that, that fella could handle his wife or his girlfriend or handle his daughter however he wanted. That ain't my business. 
the everyday language bystander approach means you sit in the barbershop and you check people. You see a 17 year old young man in the barbershop walks in to say something stupid. You simply say, boss, you don't even understand how stupid you sound right now. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me share to you what women have done for us in this country. Let me share a little something about the respect that I have for my wife or my significant other. And we speak about our healthy relationships. And I think I just touched on that just now. You, you talk to other men about what a healthy relationship looked like because some men simply don't know. They don't know how to value their significant other, how to value that woman because they themselves have had failed mothers, failed sisters, and in some cases, failed women around them who have the same level of toxicity as them. How we raise our boys. The machismo factor, the, the idea of this whole, you know, you, you, a, a man is, is, is punched down and a man is fighting. That's gotten us in the problems that we're in now. And I'm certain that I know a man that I respect very well, Stephen Dean is here who's been in the community for years. Some of our boys are so toxic because of the toxic environments that they've come in that you can't even have a discussion about conflict resolution because the only thing that they understand is that they have to be man. Man don't talk, man is fight. And so raise our boys, not only for the matter that you want to protect women, but if you raise them right, you might be protecting our country and even protecting yourself. Check anyone who glorifies the machismo factor because being a man and having the part of a male species, that's only one part of it. But if we look at the way Christ intended men to operate, the way, the way we understand humility, love, and kindness, and caring, those are the factors that we have not embraced. Those are the key principles of Christ-like living that sometimes we have not embraced because they, are, they don't mesh well with the machismo factor. This is a very true statement. It says, today I wore a pair of faded je old jeans and plain gray ba baggy shirt. I hadn't even taken a shower and I did not put on an ounce of makeup. I grabbed a worn out black oversized jacket to cover myself with even, even though it was warm outside, I've made the conscious decision lately to look less of what I felt a male would want to see. I want to disappear. In some of our communities, some young women are afraid to come outside. Some mothers are afraid to put their daughters outside because they're afraid that someone is going to take advantage of them. I think the police can tell us that the reported statistics of violence against women and the reported statistics of rape is not as high as it should be because the difficulty is getting people to actually make the statement that they were raped. And so as hard as they try, they do forensic interviewing, they pull in psychologists to do the questioning, they do a whole myriad of work and they have advanced in the last 10 years. But people fear for their lives because of male toxicity and because when a group of men get together and hide the secret, they feel as though they have nothing to fend for and nothing to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you enough food for thought I live my life by the saying, it says, measure not life by the hopes and enjoyments of this world, but by the preparation it makes for one another. Looking forward to what you shall be rather than backward to what you have been. Whether or not you have been a perpetrator before, whether or not you have had thoughts that you had to calm yourself to the point, man, where you wanted to, but you didn't. The fact is, is that every single day we walk out to make a new day in our life. And every day we walk out and there are resources that we all have to take advantage of, to make a difference individually, to make a difference collectively, and to make a difference for this nation. Be like Nike and just do it. Thank you so much.